God's grace and his peace are yours always through Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Because of him, you can wait every day with certainty because of what he's done for you. Amen. The word of God that we'll focus on this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. It's on page 8 of your worship folder. There's also a section there, a space if you'd like to take notes during this sermon. You're welcome to do that. Waiting. Yeah, waiting. How would you rate your ability to wait on a scale of 1 to 10? 1 being, why are you even asking that question? 10 being, I'll wait until the cows come home all day and until they're in the barn fed and put to bed. If you're human and you're honest, waiting is not one of our stronger suits. Perhaps you were the kid that sat in the back seat saying, imploring mom and dad again and again, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Maybe you remember the, the long line at the DMV. You sat and you waited and you waited and you're still waiting. Or perhaps it was the doctor's office. You were on time this time. You were there for your appointment. You were even early and guess what the doctor made you do? Wait. When it comes to me, I'm poor at waiting. I'm the guy who goes to King Supers and I get the shopping cart and I analyze all the lines, all the checkout lines to see which one is the shortest and which one has the fewest amount of stuff to be purchased. And then I zoom in to get to that one. And you know what usually happens when I get to that one? The lady in front of me wants to, to debate with the, the guy who's checking out if the bananas are $1.90 or $2.00. And she, no, they're a dollar ninety. That's what I'm supposed to. It's X amount per pound. No, ma'am, it's two. Get the manager over here now, and we're gonna bicker over ten cents. All the while, the the, the checkout line that had twenty carts in it has already gone through the line twice. <coughs> That's what I get for not wanting to wait. We may not be very good at waiting, but not all waiting is bad. We're waiting to celebrate the birth of Jesus. We're looking forward to that with great anticipation. We're also waiting for the day Jesus comes back. And he says he's going to. He told this to he said this to his disciples in John chapter 14. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me where I am. Jesus is coming back to bring us home to heaven. That may be on the last day when Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead. It may be when Jesus comes to you here on this earth and you close your eyes in death and open them in the eternal gates of heaven, in the eternal halls of heaven. Either way, Jesus is coming back. He promised his disciples he would come back and bring them home to heaven. So are you waiting with anticipation for that? Are you waiting with hope? With certainty for that day? That's what the word hope means in Scripture. It doesn't mean a wish or something you might po that might possibly happen. It's a certainty. Are you waiting with certainty that Jesus is coming back? Are you looking forward to that day? Or are you filled with fear and apprehension about that day? Are you wondering if you're going to be ready for that day? Are you hoping that that day never comes because you don't want to have to deal with what that means? This morning we're going to take a look at a congregation from the, the, little, from the city of Thessalonica. The Apostle Paul was there, and, and as he's writing back to them, he has a prayer for them because he's blown away at how amazing their faith is. He's astounded at the great things that God has done for them by planting faith in their hearts so that they can wait with hope for their Savior. It was truly amazing what the Apostle Paul heard about these Thessalonian Christians, considering the fact that they had only been there for about, he'd only been in that city for about three weeks. The Apostle Paul had gone to Thessalonica during his second missionary journey. And after about three weeks, a group of jealous Jews drove him out of town with violence. As soon as Paul left and these missionaries had been driven away, the Apostle Paul wanted to know what was going on in the city of Thessalonica. What was happening with these Christians that had only been there for about three weeks, only been gathered for about three weeks? Were they still growing in faith? Was their faith dying? So Paul sent his pastor buddy Timothy back to find out what was happening with these Christians in Thessalonica, and the report he got back was glowing. Take a look at verses 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, how can we thank God enough for you, 
in return for all the joy we have in, your, in the presence of our God because of you. Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. God can truly do amazing things. In only three weeks, these people in Thessalonica, these, these, this small group of Christians, not only had saving faith in Jesus, but that faith that God had planted in their hearts was producing faith and love. <coughs> they were waiting with anticipation and hope for the day that Jesus came back. God truly does amazing things. And he can take his word and plant it in people's hearts, and within just a short amount of time, they're growing and flourishing in that faith. God's done the same thing for you. And it's pretty amazing what God has done for you when you consider where we started. When we were born into this world, we were born separated from Him. We were apart from God. We were not trusting in God. We were enemies of God. We were not saved. We were destined to be separated from God forever. But then God did something. God did something long ago in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were in the very same spot that we were once in. When they had rebelled against God, God came to them and made them a promise. A promise that he would send them a Savior. And then he repeated it again and again and again and again over the course of hundreds of years, thousands of years, again and again, I will send the Savior. And people put their trust in that promise and the promise of what that Savior Jesus would do. And countless people were saved. And then when the time had fully come, God sent his Son. He was born of a woman, he was born under the law, to keep the law for us, so that we might be adopted as his children. So that we could have the rights of the sons and daughters of God. And that's why at Christmas we sing, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. The Lord kept his promise. He sent his Son as our Savior. And by his death and resurrection, you and I are saved and forgiven. And God still today brings that promise into people's lives. He brought it into your heart and life. He gave you faith which trusts in Jesus. And because of that, God declares you holy and blameless. Through Jesus, you have the promise of eternal life in heaven. And you and I are waiting with hope, waiting with joy for that day, waiting with great anticipation for the day we get to spend eternity with Jesus. It happened again today. As one more little soul was added to the tally of God's people. As one more little soul here in Ryan, and all of his sins forgiven, was given saving faith in his Savior Jesus, and given the promise of life everlasting. You and I can wait with hope for Jesus to come back, whenever that is. But let's be honest, as time goes on, it gets pretty hard, doesn't it? As we wait for him, as we wait for God, how often don't we just lapse into apathy? It's very easy to look at our life and say, I, I don't really want that day to come. I don't know if I want Jesus to come because I don't look very holy and blameless. Or we wonder if Jesus is going to keep his promise. Why does God seem to be dragging his feet with all these promises he has made? Not just the one to come back, but all the ones in between for right here and now. Why does he seem to be dragging his feet? There's a great temptation for God's people to walk out of the stadium and miss the great event before it happens. Let me explain. About four or five years ago, Kelsey and I um, took the opportunity to go see the U.S. women's national team, national <coughs> soccer team, play an international friendly, and it was very friendly, um, against the country of New Zealand. They were playing in Frisco, Texas, which is about 20 or 30 minutes north of where we lived. Opportunity to see the, what, the best soccer team in the entire world play, and so we went. But it was in February, and it was cold. Temperature at game time, start of the game was maybe 30, 32, and as the sun slowly dipped behind the stadium, it got a lot colder. We knew that the U.S. Women's National Team was going to win. They were running out all their best players. New Zealand was not very good at all. We knew, okay, it's not a solid bet that it was going to happen, but pretty confident these ladies are going to win. Went through the first half. We're freezing, and the score was 0-0. Zero to zero. We got to the second half, and we were watching and waiting for a score, and we just got colder and colder. And about 20 minutes left in the match, 15 minutes left, I looked at her, do you want to stay? Want to, there's a Tex-Mex restaurant just across the street. We could go there and have food, have some drinks, watch the rest of the game. It's a lot warmer. 
Well, I don't know. We went back and forth, back and forth. Finally, we just gave up. Well, I convinced her to give up. <laughs> and we went to the And guess what happened? As soon as we walked out the front gate, <sighs> I scored their first goal. Walked across the street, wrecked across the street, sat down at the bar, all of a sudden, <sighs> they scored their second goal within the span of a couple of minutes. And they ended up beating New Zealand 2 to nothing. We grew apathetic, and we didn't have confidence that it was actually going to happen, that they were actually going to win. And so we walked out of the stadium, and we missed the big event. Now granted, it wasn't a guaranteed victory. And yet when it comes to Jesus, and it comes to his promises, those are certain. It's a guaranteed victory. It's a great temptation that you and I face to walk out of the stadium and miss the big event. As our Heavenly Father seems to be dragging his feet, the Apostle Paul latches onto that. He understood that for these Christians in Thessalonica. He knew it's one thing to be a Christian. It's great that you've become a Christian. But God wants you to become a more mature Christian. We're not finished products this side of eternity. We have salvation, but our faith needs to continually be strengthened. Our hope needs to continually be renewed continually growing in faith and love. And that was what the Apostle Paul prayed for these Thessalonian Christians, and what I pray for you, that we would continue to wait with hope. And God tells us how. Take a look at the next final two verses. We're going to skip verse 11. We're going to look at verses 12 and 13. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. The joys of getting over sickness and doing public speaking. The Apostle Paul prayed for these Thessalonian Christians, that he would have the opportunity to, to add to their faith. That they would continue to grow in the, in the strength of that they were holy and blameless. The confidence that they were that. Because Paul knew the great temptation, like I just mentioned, for all of God's people is to walk out of the stadium. To see the fact that God is, seems to be dragging his feet. Where is this God and what he's promised? And what he's supposed to be doing, what he says he's going to do. Where is this Jesus who says he's going to come back? It was a great temptation to backslide, and the Apostle Paul prayed for them, and he could renew their faith again and again. That was his prayer for them, and he wanted that to be a priority for them. So is that your priority? To grow in faith. To grow in faith and love. To have that, that certainty that you are holy and blameless before God. To have that strengthened again and again. As you're looking to make your Christmas list, you still do that type of thing. Where is growth and faith on that? As you sit down at night and pray to your God, where is growing in faith in that prayer? If you're thinking of New Year's resolutions, maybe you're going to make some big changes next year. Is one of those changes to be around God's word more often so that your faith is strengthened and you can grow? As we take a look at our own life, holy and blameless, we realize, and there's a reason why at times we, we don't have the confidence that we are ready to be with Jesus or that we want him to come back because we look at our own lives and realize they're not very holy and blameless. God wants us to grow in faith and love and show the love that he has to us. So when we look at our love towards others in comparison to God's love for us, what does it look like? A God who has unconditional love for people, how often doesn't our love come with conditions? A God, God's love is initiating. He starts it. He loves. He loves fully. And that causes love to, to be given back. How often don't we wait for people to love before we love in return? Or think of our faith. How easy is it to, to trust in our own strength and our own ability or to despair because of our own strength and our own ability when we look to trust in those things to save us or to rescue us or to help us? 
How many times we put our trust in things and what we've accomplished in life rather than the one who has made all and has given all and preserves all. How often haven't we doubted whether God is really going to be true to his promises? He says them, but when's he going to keep them? When is he going to stop dragging his feet and come through on these things that he has said he's going to do? It's not too difficult for us to fall into the apathy or the despair. To look at our life and realize it's not very holy and blameless. <coughs> so what I want to do is take you back to that Garden of Eden again. When a man and a woman stood in front of God, their heads hung in shame, and their bodies covered with whatever leaves they could find to, to cover their, their nakedness. And the fruit was still, the juices of fruit were still dripping down the sides of their mouth. And then God stood in front of them. I want to take you to a throne room where the most powerful, prideful king sat on his throne in front of God's holy prophet and his head now hung in shame. Because he had been exposed for his affair, for his adultery, for the murder, and for the plot that went along with it. And there he stood before the Lord's prophet. Or take you to the, the nation of Babylon, where a, a nation of people called the Israelites now lived because they refused to listen to God's warnings from his prophets to turn away from idols and turn back to God. And there they stood and sat in Babylon, their heads hung in shame, and God came to them with a message. And what did God say to each and every one of them? I'm going to send you a Savior. Adam and Eve, David, people of Israel, I'm going to renew my covenant with you. I have promised to send you a Savior, and I'm going to do it. In spite of the fact that you are holy and blame, you are not holy and blameless, Adam and Eve, David, Babylon, people, people of Israel, I'm going to send my Savior. I, the Lord, will be your God. He pointed the people back to the covenant that he had made with them. Not the commitment they had made to God, but he came and forgave them. He forgave their wickedness and remembered their sins no more. Removed their sinfulness as far as the east is from the west. He said it this way, in that second, that first lesson from the book of Jeremiah. He said to his people, In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. And God did it. God brought that righteous Savior and the forgiveness of sins for all of those people. And now, dear friends, that same God who came through on that promise is the same God in whom we trust. The God who promises that he's going to come back at the end of time. The God who promises that he's going to come back. And when you and I stand here on a Sunday morning doing this thing we call confessing our sins and receiving God's forgiveness, doing the very same thing that Adam and Eve and David and the children of Israel and countless numbers of God's people have done. We stand before God with our lives wide open. Our heads hung in shame. Lord God, we're not holy and blameless. We've sinned against you. And God stands before you and says to you again and again, look at what I have done for you. Look what I have done for you in Jesus Christ, your Savior. By his death and resurrection, you are forgiven. Look at the covenant I made with you at your baptism when I promised that I would be your God and you would be my people. I am true to that covenant and true to that promise. You are my children holy and dearly loved, blameless for the day that Jesus comes back. And it's there around word and sacrament that you and I are strengthened, that our hold on Jesus gets stronger and stronger because his hold on us is firm with an iron grip. It's through those tools that Jesus strengthens our hope so that we can wait each and every day. So dear friends, as you're waiting for Jesus to come back, whenever that day may be, wait with hope. Because through Jesus Christ, you are holy and blameless. As you wait for God to fulfill his promises to you in your life, here and now, wait with hope. Because the God who made those promises is the God who came through on his promise to send you a Savior. He's done it. And he'll continue to do it until he fulfills that last great promise to bring you to eternity with him in heaven forever. Amen.